In this edition of Falmouth in Focus, we learn about what happens to your trash after it's hauled away, spend an afternoon with the canine contestants of the Cranberry Cluster Dog Show, and we find out what clipper time means at Falmouth High School. All this and much more on this episode of Falmouth in Focus. Hello and welcome to Falmouth in Focus, FCTV's current affairs program. I'm your host, Michael Kasparian. We start off this episode with a look at the 9-11 memorial held at the Falmouth Fire Station. The annual ceremony memorializes those who lost their lives, including their fellow first responders in the tragic events of September 11th, 2001. The Upper Cape Regional Transfer Station serves as a hub for disposal of non-hazardous solid waste for the town of Falmouth and other Upper Cape towns. Their goal is to preserve Cape Cod's fragile environment by diverting materials that would otherwise end up in a landfill. We paid them a visit to get a closer look at just what happens after your trash is hauled off. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Rosansky. I'm the general manager of the Upper Cape Regional Transfer Station, which is located on the border of the Otis Air Force Base, the rear gate. Here at the transfer station, we interact with not only Covosa trucks, but public trucks that bring construction, demolition debris to us from the local area, as far as Yarmouth, Woods Hole, Sandwich. They bring the material here where it's weighed, it's dumped on the floor and we process it. We pull out all recyclable materials, metals, wood, aluminum, anything that's uh, tires that needs to be pulled out, cans, paint, all that stuff is pulled out, properly disposed of and recycled. The rest of the material is put into rail cars, which we then ship off Cape as far as Lordstown, Ohio, which is just south of Cleveland, as well as Niagara, New York. When a, a new customer comes into the facility, he enters, the first thing he sees is our scale, which they'll drive up on and get their entry weight, their full weight. They'll come up, we'll drop the load, we'll process it. They'll go back onto the scale empty, weigh out, and then come back up, and that ticket will determine the cost of the disposal fee for the day. When the material is processed through the building to my right, it goes into rail cars, which are just behind me here. These rail cars come in two different sizes. Some can handle about 80 tons, others can handle approximately 100 tons. And what we do is we take the material that's processed, we load it into these cars, and instead of having to take it one truck at a time, one six ton load, one 10 ton load at a time, we can put somewhere between 80 and 100 tons in one rail car, which then goes over the rail bridge, not the transportation bridge, and is taken to the facilities that I mentioned before, one in Lordstown, Ohio, the other one in Niagara, New York. We have 20 total rail cars in our fleet. We're processing about one a day. We're sending about five cars a week out during our peak volume, which is about 100 tons a day, and that's how we keep the floor steady with the material coming in. That adds a lot of benefit to the economy here as well because we're not utilizing the gas, we're not wear and tear on the roads. The trucks that would normally be taking that material up and down the highways are completely free to do something else. By adding this facility to Cape Cod's capacity, what we've been able to do is provide another location for businesses that deal with construction and demolition debris, uh, contractors, roofers, builders, fencing material, all that stuff which was formerly taken in some cases off Cape over the bridge which would tie up traffic, utilize the trucks and wear and tear, take up lots of gas and unnecessary trips. Those trucks can now locally come here much easier, much more efficiently, much more effectively. So we're allowing the local economy to benefit from those economies of scale, leverage some of this place's facility and capabilities to help run their businesses more efficiently and effectively as well. Thanks to Andrew Richards for that coverage. It's time now for three things from Town Hall, FCTV's condensed version of the takeaways from recent municipal meetings. Selections are chosen based on community impact. At the last meeting of the Falmouth Board of Selectmen, the budget policy for fiscal year 2020 was discussed. Jennifer Petit, Director of Finance, presented some changes to the policy which serves as a guide for staff who look to maintain the town's financial goals when they begin to assemble the town's budget. 
So in the revenue policy, under local estimated receipts, uh, we are going to look at an increase in allocation of estimated receipts. Um, it's, it will be consistent with the town's overall fiscal policy of conservative revenue estimates. Um, in this circumstance, we'll permit the town to fund additional public safety positions in the operating budget. So really what we're looking at, I mean, and it's a budget policy, and it's more, you know, big picture, if you will, but we are really going to look at some public safety positions and um, see what we can find, see what we can fit in two and a half, but, you know, probably take some estimated receipts. So more police and fire for Falmouth. We're looking at that, yeah. The selectmen heard a report from town engineer John McLaughlin and John Ramsey from Applied Coastal Research and Engineering regarding a study of the erosion along Minot Beach. The intent is to protect and enhance the existing beach, along with rebuilding the roadway, bridge, and entrance to Bourne's Pond Inlet. We've been working on the, the inlet widening project for several years, and really came up as a good point as, uh, to make sure that that, you know, as, if that, as that goes forward, trying to get that inlet widened is the last thing you wanted to have happen is build the bridge and then uh, not have a road that connects it to the, the mm -hmm. remainder of town. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, needs to uh, be looked at. That this is going to be an ongoing challenge that the town just continues to mitigate and it'll never be one, you know, one single fix, but that everything isn't a $30 million project. I mean, there are some things that we are, we already do beach nourishment. There are some of these things we already know how to do that can help to um, mitigate some of those, um, some of that erosion. Jeremiah Pearson, Falmouth's tree warden and park superintendent, presented a status report for the removal of three large diseased trees from Main Street. The selectmen were presented with information pertaining to the maintenance of the remaining trees downtown. So the first one you can see is at the post office. That is positive for uh, Dutch Elm disease. Um, the next one at Maxwell and Company, also positive for uh, Dutch Elm disease. The board also heard from town manager Julian Suso about the negotiations with the federal government to share some of the excessive cost of removing one of the trees located in front of the U.S. Post Office. Jeremiah will confirm this is significantly time sensitive. Uh, and uh, thankfully, uh, with Jeremiah's able to help, we can deal with those trees that are within the towns right away. But this one that is on post office property, we're hoping to have uh, be able to team up and partner with them. Um, the federal government to take that down properly. To see the meetings in their entirety, check out Government Channel 15's program schedule at fctv.org. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we will look at another event that honors fallen heroes. Stay with us. Although the upcoming election is not a presidential one, it is one that is very important for Massachusetts. We will be electing a U.S. Senator, nine U.S. Representatives, a Governor, State Constitutional Officers, all State Legislators, Governor's Council, and many County positions. How do we, as a State, work together to make sure Massachusetts is run and represented in the best way? If we, the State of Massachusetts, want to make a change, we need to get in the game and vote in 2018. Your vote counts. Welcome back. The inaugural Southern New England Brotherhood Ride honored 14 fallen heroes who died in the line of duty by cycling through Massachusetts and Rhode Island, traveling over 270 miles in four days and averaging 70 to 90 miles a day. We caught up with the Brotherhood Ride as it made its final stop in Falmouth to honor Gregory Clements, a Falmouth firefighter who passed away last year. My name is Andy Weagle and I'm the president of the Southern New England Brotherhood Ride. Um, this is the third chapter of the Brotherhood Ride uh, the, that was started in June, June 18th of 2007 after the uh, Charleston, South Carolina Super Sofa Warehouse Fire, also known as the Fire of the Charleston Nine. Nine heroes lost their lives that day and the Brotherhood founder, Jeff Morse from Naples, Fire, uh, Naples Florida, he, felt com he was out to dinner with his wife for his anniversary and when they heard of the news. And so he felt compelled to do something for those families. They tossed around a few ideas on how to honor these guys. Uh, they wanted to do something other than just raise money and mail a check. They wanted to put a little uh, grit and determination into it. So they decided to ride bikes from Naples, Florida into Charleston, South Carolina. It just happened to take nine days for them to do it. So they called it Nine Days for Nine Heroes. 
it was supposed to be a one-time ride and unfortunately every year since then there's had to be another brotherhood ride there are now three chapters there's the original chapter in florida of the brotherhood ride there's also the texas chapter and now there's the southern new england chapter this chapter will honor any line of duty death suffered in connecticut massachusetts or rhode island and we ride our bicycles a year after the, the incident to show the families, the communities, and the co-workers at their respective departments that their sacrifice will never be forgotten. Uh, we started Friday morning. Uh, we got on the road after our opening ceremonies, probably about 9 o'clock. And we rode um, just about 75 miles that day. We made an honor stop for Robert Bob Lavalley out of New Bedford Fire Department. We then went to Cranston, Rhode Island and honored uh, Kevin Ling. From there we went to North Providence to honor uh, David DiOrio. And our final honor stop of that day was in Pawtucket for David Beauclair. We spent the night at the Attleboro Elks Lodge before, and the next morning we started at eight o'clock. And we went from the Attleboro Elks Lodge to the Brockton Police Department to honor the loss of their canine uh, Canine Coda. From there, we went up to Fitchburg and we honored John Mulcahy. And from, from there, we spent the night at the Lemonster Elks Lodge. The next morning, we, being Sunday morning, we rode from the Lemonster to Devon's Fire Department to honor uh, Richard Stevens. We went to Lexington Fire Department to honor Kenneth Donnelly. We then went to Arlington Fire Department to honor Stephen Porciello. And we went from there to MIT in Cambridge for the fifth year anniversary of Sean Collier's murder related to the Boston bombing. And we also honored Officer Dennis Simmons of the Boston Police Department. We spent the night at the Brighton Elks Lodge la uh, last night. And this morning being Monday morning, we started up in Brighton and we came, traveled down to here in Falmouth to honor Gregory Clements. Unfortunately, due to such time restraints before the ride, we weren't able to go out to the western part of the state. Uh, there's three heroes out there that we're still honoring, and the families will be receiving a donation from us. Um, that was Anthony Spano of Chicopee Fire Department, uh, Chief Stephen Fry of the Montgomery Fire Department, and Robert Davis of Northampton Fire Department. In the 11 years since the Brotherhood Ride was founded, uh, we've been able to raise over $400,000 and hand deliver a check to each family who has lost their loved one who paid the ultimate sacrifice. In addition to honoring the fallen, the Brotherhood Ride also hopes to raise awareness of the sacrifices made by the first responders while serving and protecting their communities. Thanks to Jeff Wyman for that piece. The Cape Cod and South Shore Kennel Clubs get together every year for their Cranberry Cluster Dog Show at the Barnstable County Fairgrounds. In addition to the judging of all categories, there were also obedience and rally trials and a first ever North American Diving Dogs competition. FCTV was there to check out this year's group of canine hopefuls. <music> Every September uh, at the fairgrounds we have uh, a four-day dog show. Uh, the Cape Cod Kennel Club and the South Shore Kennel Club combined to make a, uh, a cluster show which is four days of nothing but dogs and hopefully sun and a good time for everybody. We have 11 rings going and dogs, uh, this is called, called a confirmation where dogs are judged uh, for best in show. Uh, it starts all the way from the, the best in breed up to best in show, but it's 119 different breeds all come together, and throughout the day they compete against their own their own breed, and then we, it kind of gets whittled down to like the top seven, and then the top seven become the best in show. 
I'm a dog owner. I'm a breeder of whippets. Um, I've been doing this since I was a little kid in high school, which means back in the 60s. I had a, a family member that showed dogs, an aunt and uncle that showed dogs, and I spent a week with them one summer, and I was hooked. There's all kinds of activities you can compete in. The confirmation is fun because we consider ourselves, as breeders, we consider ourselves, this isn't just, you know, a dog eat dog beauty competition. This is, we're, we call ourselves preservation breeders. We admire uh, the history behind each of our breeds and we're trying to maintain the quality and the integrity and the health of, uh, of these individual breeds because they all had a purpose originally. The heavily coated dogs require a great deal of, uh, of time and effort and grooming and uh, you know some of these handlers are absolute masters at, at what they do. There are so many things you can do with your dog, whether it's purebred or not. There's dock diving, there's obedience, there's agility, there's, uh, you know, and all of it, all of these kennel clubs usually offer all of these activities. So today we were um, dock diving to see if Taya could get her junior dock diving title, which she accomplished today. Thanks to Bob Fenstermaker for that piece. Ryan Collins of My Fishing Cape Cod takes us out night fishing for brown sharks here in Falmouth on this month's fishing report. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the My Fishing Cape Cod Falmouth Fishing Report for the month of September. In this video, we join My Fishing Cape Cod founder and creator Ryan Collins as he targets brown sharks from the boat. In this video, we are targeting brown sharks here on Cape Cod from my boat. The Miss Loretta and this took place on Wednesday evening September 5th 2018. Brown shark fishing on Cape Cod gets going during August and you can definitely continue to catch them through the month of September. The south side, Vineyard Sound, Nantucket Sound, that's where you want to go for these sharks. So once John found the spot, we motored up to where he wanted to fish and we just dropped the anchor. We were only in about 11 feet of water, so we were pretty close to the beach. And keep in mind that you can catch these sharks from shore yep, at night. So when fishing from a boat, you really don't have to go too far, just a little bit farther than you would be able to cast from the beach out in 10, 11, 12 feet of water. That's all you need to do. You gotta be kidding me. We were just saying bottom of the night fight. You gotta be kidding me. That is unbelievable. Two minutes and then we were gonna call it quits. How about that? That is ridiculous. This shark fell for a piece of freshly dead bluefish attached to six ounces of weight. If you've never handled sharks before, we highly recommend going fishing for them with someone who has in the past. Long pliers or a de-hooking device is a must for this style of fishing. just kind of hanging out right now. Right. Hold on. <laughs> I'll tell you, there's something about this backpack coral fin. Yeah. That they will just sit here and hang out. Oh, really? You watch out. The, the second I go for his tail, he's going to So let me know when you're all set with everything. Get it. These fish are also very flexible. So use great caution when touching or handling their tail at all. Well, whenever you're ready, I suppose we can. These fish are known for inhabiting the waters off of Falmouth. 
plenty of life left. And offer fishermen an extreme angling opportunity. Until next time, everyone, tight lines and take care. I still can't believe that. Thanks to Andrew Burke for that piece. We'll be back with a look at Clipper Time at Falmouth High School. Stay with us. Welcome back. For the past three years, Falmouth High School has set aside 33 minutes of daily, flexible time used by students for extra help, intervention, support, enrichment, or extension. Called Clipper Time, this academic time isn't like a traditional study hall or advisory period. It is student-driven, targeted, and academic. Here's more about the program. Uh, Clipper Time is a 33-minute flexible block that occurs every day at Falmouth High School. On Monday, students meet with a mentor, faculty, or staff member who checks in with them uh, on their academics mostly, how they're doing in their classes, and then helps them figure out where they're going to spend clipper time for Tuesday through Friday that week. Students are able to get extra help, extra support, they're able to check in on skills maybe they didn't understand to make up work. And as one of our teachers uh, put it so well, clipper time is like after school help built into the school day. Uh, for the wide variety of students we see uh, every day at Falmouth High School, whether it's our students who take four AP classes, um, our students who need to work after school to support their families, to maybe get a younger sibling off the bus, it's hard with the hit and miss of after school to reach everyone. And what Clipper Time does is it allows us to reach each student each day at Falmouth High School. The reason we're continuing Clipper Time in this third year of a pilot uh, is because of the overwhelming support it's gotten from both faculty, staff, and students. Along with that, parents have also uh, really vocalized how much they appreciate Clipper Time. What we've seen is a decrease in stress around homework, around time management. So last year we took a survey and in that survey students really commented on how much their homework stress had decreased how much it helped relationship building with uh, teachers around the school, that they could go to them in a smaller group or even at times one-on-one, -on -one, uh, get the help they needed and, and move on to the next task. So um, we're still gathering data on a regular basis. We're looking at uh, student grades, student work. We're looking at assessment results. And we're really trying to get a whole picture of Clipper Time and how it's helping our kids, not just through one measure like uh, the, something like the MCAS, but really looking at, at the whole student, looking at the whole school and the whole school community and what we're able to do uh, to help every kid every single day. Clipper time for me has helped me a lot basically because sometimes I'm sometimes like nervous to ask questions during class and so like with Clipper time I can have that one-on-one -on -one experience with teachers to ask them any problems with like homework or any tests coming up. Also the teachers, like it's a smaller class smaller class with students so you have that better like one-on-one -on -one experience with teachers and it just helped me a lot with like homework wise and so I can get stuff done because in case I like sports afterwards it can help me get stuff done and any questions I have in class I don't ask I can ask the teachers. Um, Clipper time is really important because I can help get my homework done and I receive um, like help from my teachers before a test like that was really huge yesterday for me. Yeah I think it's a really important part of our schedule and we need it. Um, I think Clipper Time is a great way to get your homework done or to meet teachers if you don't have time after school especially because a lot of the time it's hard to coordinate with teachers, you know, to stay after a certain day and to get a ride home. But with Clipper Time you can do that any day whenever you want. Thank you to Ryan Weber for that report. Falmouth's Carousel of Light is one of the last remaining hand-carved carousels in the country. They recently honored their 100,000th rider since the colorful ride opened at the Mullen Hall School. FCTV contributor Troy Clarkson was there for the celebration. So the Carousel of Light uh, is a nonprofit organization that operates this beautiful hand-carved work of art, uh, the, the masterpiece of Falmouth resident Lance Schinkle. And we've operated here uh, on this site for the last five years with the support and help of both the Falmouth School Department and the town of Falmouth. And so we're very grateful for their support uh, over these last several years. We're here today to, commem to, to commemorate the 100,000th rider of the carousel. Imagine that, 100,000. 
That's 100,000 memories for thousands of families right here on this spot, uh, all because of the hard work of some wonderful volunteers. So to present our certificate for our 100,000th rider, our past president, Jim Bowen. I present this award to Daisy Talbert, age seven, as our 100,000th rider. And Daisy, five years ago, this was one of Daisy's favorite places and she was here almost every day, so it's only fitting that she came along yesterday, just in time at about 2.30, and was the 100,000th rider. So congratulations, Daisy. Congratulations to Daisy and thank you to Jim for all your hard work. To present our Volunteer of the Year is our Vice President and tireless worker, Don Terry. Teddy's up here all the time, tirelessly, energetically, enthusiastically, doing anything that we need done. And that means a lot of things, including taking out the trash, right, Teddy? So Teddy's also seven, and so he gets our first Volunteer of the Year award. Here you go, Teddy. Now, I have Caitlin here, too, because, you know, once people get awards, sometimes you never see them again. I'm not sure that that's going to be true of Teddy. So, Caitlin, you're here all the time, too, and if you keep coming for next year, I can't promise anything, but I think you're going to be Volunteer of the Year next year. So, thank you very much, All right. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations. Thank you, pal. And before I give it, and before I give it back to Troy... I just want to mention, because I am up here every day, but I'm here for about a half an hour a day, mostly to keep track of the money, which is very good. So, the person who's here eight, nine, ten hours a day, every day, is Miss Beth. At 11 o'clock in the morning and at 8 o'clock at night, Miss Beth is giving everybody a hug when they go on and everybody a sticker when they come back. And has been doing it for five years. So thank you so much, Beth. So there you have it. Dozens of kids enjoying free ice cream, but more importantly than that, enjoying the beauty and the aura of Lance Schinkel's masterpiece right here uh, in Falmouth Village. We're so very grateful to be able to help tell this story uh, of this nonprofit, of this masterpiece, and of this great community that supports the Carousel of Light. So as it moves forward, we'll be able to continue to tell you the story and bring it to you here on FCTV and to help the story, to help tell the story of Lance Schinkel's opus. I am Falmouth Enterprise columnist Troy Clarkson, and that's my take. Back to you, Michael. Thank you, Troy, for that piece, and congratulations to Daisy. FCTV wants you to know that television can be as easy as hitting record on your smartphone. We'd like to invite all Falmouth residents and visitors to share their slice of life with us. Email us your photos and videos, or upload them to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram using the hashtag MyFalmouth or Falmouth in Focus to be featured on the show. Thank you to our most recent contributors. We leave you now with the sights and sounds of anything but a boat race in Woods Hole. Thanks for watching Falmouth in Focus. We'll see you next time.